Hi, everybody. My name is Oren Jacob. That's too loud. There we go. Hi, everybody. I'm Oren Jacob. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pullstring. Uh, Amir and Chris and some folks asked me to spend the first, I guess, 28 and a half minutes here um, trolling for a bunch of questions for you guys about the future of the industry, um, both in the creative and technical side of the field of bots and computer <coughs> conversation. So this is meant to be a provocative uh, 27 and a half minutes later um, to hopefully uh, spur a bunch of conversation afterwards. So as a starting slide, um, the technology field, broadly speaking, is playing a natural language today. Um, that's what this whole set, everybody here is in that field in some way, shape, or form. Um, messenger's eating your phone. Alexa's about to eat my house anyway, for sure. Um, I love that when we unbox our Alexa, our Echo specifically with Alexa on it. The second thing my daughter asked was, are you my friend? Point, point, yes, cool, and that was it. Like, she was in. Um, and now we just heckle her all the time at every meal. So I have to tell my kids, stop talking to our Echo, talk to mom and dad instead now. It's actually, she's stolen the conversational focus of our house. Um, this metaphor is a fundamental change, uh, broadly speaking, and this talk today is focused on the character and conversation parts of that fundamental change we're going through. A key point I want to make, and we're here at New York TIS, which is pretty cool, um, this field we're in is a combination of linear and interactive arts. There are not many of those things. It's new and unusual to do that. <clears throat> On the linear side, we have the craft of screenwriting, stage writing, poetry and prose, the act of dialogue creation. Uh, the word is the atomic element of design that we use. We have to pick different words, put them in different orders and assemble them. And that is a lineage that reaches into literary arts. The other part is interactive, which is where technology comes in because people answer back to us. That comes from video gaming, of web design, and the art of creating engagement and retention. Those are the interactive arts. Very few things in the world will come across mix those two things together as deeply as they are bound here. And that changes the kinds of businesses you can build and the kind of challenges that we have. In particular, it takes two to make a conversation. Two equals one plus one. Here's some examples. I happen to have worked on this film for five years, so I thought I'd toss that in there for a minute. Um, but Dory and Marlon are talking in this slide here too. Oh, wrong direction, there we go. Um, Vader and Luke. Together we are rule the galaxy. No, I'm your father. No! That's actually a conversation, although it's a very dramatic one. Um, and we're just swapping out one of those two with a fancy computer. That's our job. So the fact that the other person's human and the other side's a computer forms a conversation two ways. And that's a very unique interaction, broadly speaking, famously shot in New York here about I'll have what she's having. Now, I noticed that I quoted a couple lines from films in these slides. That's because we remember these experiences because the conversations that occurred in them are noteworthy, and that's because those lines of dialogue that were offered here, especially that woman back there, she says, I'll have what she's having, um, encompasses and summarizes an entire backstory of the characters, their motivations, the scene that took place in the experience of watching the film, the date you were on when you went there, which might have gone well or gone poorly, depending on how it went for you at the movie, generally speaking. Um, we remember those characters, and conversation is a way to do that communicates to us and is also how we communicate to each other. The adventures of language itself is one of the most human experiences that is there and perhaps defines humanity. But there are exceptions. Not all conversations have two. Sometimes they only have one. So schizophrenics are a bit of a weird agenda. If I had to throw Gollum up here for a second, he talks to himself. But even in the film when he's lost himself about the precious my ring, he debates and then doesn't. And then changes side and argues back and forth. He, in fact, is two characters at once, unusually, but I thought I'd throw an exception there for you nerds in the audience. So, if you're winning in the bot space, your bot traffic's going up and to the right, and Betaworks is already throwing cash on you at a moment's notice. That's because you've got an engagement and retention going on, and you've created dialogue in a character that works. In a different term, you have successfully built an experience that has the similar qualities to, and is presented directly adjacent to, and it feels enough like conversation that people come back and keep talking to your bot. I want to make that point about adjacency for a second. We can pick on any platform with folks who work here at Slack, Messenger, Google Platforms, Amazons, and the rest. There are tons of people talking on Slack channels right now, and they're all human. Messenger's full of a billion humans talking back and forth to each other. Oh, my bot's on there too? Your bot is adjacent to a billion humans nerding out, texting each other in Messenger right now today and your bot is living in the context of that. There are no bot-only networks. Bots exist in places where humans already are. Or even in the case of an Alexa, it's a human talking to your echo back and forth that's answering back, back and forth. So the human condition is always involved in these things, and as a design adjacency is a super, I think, missed point broadly in the industry. This is not the case of launching a video game on an Xbox where I'm looking at other video games. Messenger is full of a billion people talking today. 
your bot that sneaks in there on the side is next to all those things and constantly surrounded by them. Same in Slack. Slack channels are full of people talking back and forth all the time too. And because of that, that I think is a hurdle of design and achievement that is, a that is a, I think, foundational to the space because of the ways that bots present themselves. They present in other networks, broadly speaking. All right, so let's get a little math nerdy here. <clears throat> the difference between character and engagement is measured as a very, very large number, a Google, if you will, that I thought of Google friends back there. Engagement and retention are relatively easily measured. You can use scientific-ish approaches to understand if I change this and maybe test that. I improved or did improve that as well too. Character and dialogue are not like that. If they were, music, Hollywood theater, poetry, Broadway, we're here in New York, and prose would be algorithmically derived. Big slide, character is not algorithmically derived. Not algorithmically derived. There we got that, not, not. But a $1 million question would be, do we want to teach computer programmers to create conversation as good as a Terry Gross interview, or want to build tools to help Terry Gross and other professionals create compelling computer conversation? There are two ways to look at this field. If we think the probability of success is higher by getting a bunch of Stanford bachelors in computer science and teaching them to get a five in the AP English test and become great screenwriters, that's an agenda. A different agenda is to build tools for the professionals in the world to craft and language today and help them create computer conversation. Take the moment to process that and let's look back at some fields by analogy. Let's look at photography, uh, painting, and digital imagery for a second. Is Photoshop the thing that today would let Rembrandt paint on a Mac? Or is Photoshop the thing today that will let Bill Gates become Rembrandt? Uh, I'm gonna buy on the Rembrandt side. You wanna build, I believe we should build tools for folks who craft in words, who craft in language, and help them come to the face of interactive language. That's what we're doing here. That's an advocacy and something to debate the rest of the day. Let's see, I'm trolling you already, good. Um, but uh, actually, a bunch of things in the world today suck, which is a bummer. Knock, knock, who's there? I'm done with that bot already. There are lots of things that are out there that are not very good today. In fact, there are tons piling into Messenger that are an utter bore, broadly speaking. This is a claim that this room is about advancing this field. And it's our job, as being early in the field as we are, this is early, by the way. I got 20 bucks says this room is 5,000 people in about two years from now, and then 50,000 people in about 10 years from now. Today, it's, what are we, 80 here, 60? Something like that, under 100, okay. At this point, this early in the field, <clears throat> our job is to try to move this field forward together. Hi, uh, rising tide will raise all ships here. There aren't that many ships actually right now yet. <laughs> There'll be more ships soon. Um, but I want to observe that this field has both technical and a creative side, and that makes it difficult to figure out what to do here or not. On a technology side only, fine. I'll fund Microsoft and Google and all the big technology giants and look crutches like bugs. On the creative side, that's fine. I'll go to New York Tisch and hire a bunch of artists. But these are both these things play here together. So how do we do that? An advocacy. It's all about creative control. All about creative control. Let's talk about tools then. As a tool troll, Yes, VI is better than Emacs. Here we go. Let's do it. Um, but in particular, Photoshop, Illustrator, Final Cut Pro, the lists of all the tools that have been built uh, here that I put up are examples of how technology and art bridge each other together. And those things fundamentally change the industries of music, of photography, of imaging, of animation and film were all changed in the past 20 years at a foundational level. <coughs> and VI is better than Emacs. No one's taking that troll bait? Who knows what VI and Emacs are in this room? <laughs> That's it? Oh, wait, seriously, guys? Sublime. Yeah, if you want to go modern, man, kick it old school. We got IRC thrown in here in AOL, isn't it, Jet? <laughs> One more time, show of hands. Who has heard the letters VI and Emacs? Thank you. Okay, come on, people. Wake up. All right, here we go. It's morning. Thank you. <laughs> VI, <laughs> boom. Right now. Right now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Who actually has a VI one? <laughs> it's a memory right now. Um, <clears throat> going back to creative control, I had I just had a throw a carbon slider. It's like my authority. Um, I want to talk about things that are not creative control we do in the industry today. So when an output equals a random call on an input, black boxes are terrible, terrible, terrible things to give artists because they can't predict the result of what comes in and out the far side. Here's an example. Why did my machine learned inductive intent match or reject that line? Um, I don't know, give us some more data, it gets better next time. Boo, that's a terrible agenda. That's like if the blur function in Photoshop randomly blurred your image. 
Like, no, I want to blur it this much and see it. Oh, undo, let's try it again. Thank you, okay? That's how that works. Not, not a linear relationship is not required here. A predictable relationship is, in general, when it comes to building tools for artists. The human mind is phenomenally good at mapping nonlinear transfer functions to muscle memory. We can ride bicycles. There's mine, I just bought it last year, it's super rad. And <clears throat> as I ride this beautiful piece of carbon fiber machinery from Switzerland, on it, as I adjust the handlebar oh so much, it exactly turns the way left I want to go. And when I switch my fancy electronic shifting transmission and I climb up a hill, it works exactly the way I want to go. A predictable response on a super turboatomic nonlinear system is understandable by a four-year-old after three crashes. The three crashes are you learning to map in your mind the nonlinear transfer function of balance on a bike moving forward and pedal control and back and forth. It's super hard to do that. In fact, physicists today across the street in the NYU School of Physics do not understand completely why when I push a bike forward and not on it, why it keeps going. The counterbalancing force is the centrifugal force and steering as well too are not actually fully described in equations of motion to this day. Nutter, right? However, my five-year-old rides a bike just fine. So back to the slide before a second ago. If we put things in front of people creating bots that are not predictable, they'll create shitty bots because they won't know what they're doing and they won't understand the responses. Telling someone who's writing a thing to throw more data at it, first of all, what does a lot and what does better mean? I have no idea how to deal with that, but yet my bot's matching this intent and it's not supposed to. Why not? I don't know. We can do better than that. There's, there's a good chore for everybody here. Scooting forward, who knows what this picture's from? Actually, it's a zoomed-in picture. Yep, go. French famous painter. Paris? Drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> this is Syrah, uh, Day in the Park. You'll find it in Chicago as well, too. We'll talk about some more in a second. I'm going to talk about here about multi-resolution viewing and editing. These are separate and fundamental concepts to controlling an artistic and technical process that's hard to control. <clears throat> I'm trying to fix this part of my bot, it's not working. Well, that's okay because you can look at this line of intent over here and your contents over there in some other window, so go figure that out. What the fuck? That's terrible. The reason that this can become that is because you can work by going way the hell in and dropping a point of paint, which is how this is a pointless painting, because you follow this agenda, and I can back way the hell back here and see the whole damn thing. Who knows how big this thing is in real life? Yeah, how big? Compared to this, how big? This size? Not even close, it's twice that size, dude. It goes from like here to, oh, it's like 22, 25 feet across. It's crazy, it's a whole wall in a room. Yet, when you walk up to that thing, whoops, wrong way, that was a tight, it was working a second. These painting brush strokes are about half the size in real life. So the fact that Syrah was working at a distance of 40 feet and an inch, and 40 feet and an inch, is the act of zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out in Photoshop. And you're doing that, or in Word, by scroll down, scroll up, scroll down, scroll up. Oh, type, 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 scroll down, scroll up, scroll down, scroll up. Moving in and moving out of a thing is the act of managing the complexity of it. And offering context allows people to create at a level of complexity we would otherwise not be able to do. Those of you calculating the mathematical function here, the distance between your content and your intent, if they're very, very far apart, you have no context offered. And if you're offering great context, that means context is a big number, one over that means distance is very, very small. Content and intent are close together. The closer together you are, the more context you can offer. And <clears throat> the time to complete your work dramatically changes. Without context, one cannot create ambitious, coherent work. As atomic elements combine and form a greater whole, Context allows us to manage complexity, and this world is complicated. It's complicated because we're talking about human language, which is perhaps the essential human invention. We invented language to talk to each other, so we can share ideas and persist that across a fireside chat while you're a caveman and across generations and then across civilizations. That's a complicated agenda. In fact, language holds the weight of the human condition itself. If something happened to us, we talk about it. Everything that happens to us, we talk about. It therefore is as broad as our condition as humans. That is a huge design space. Way bigger than color, way bigger than sound by itself. That is the extent of the human condition. Let's not underestimate that. So given that statement, finding ways to go from here, Zork, who had the Zork that I wrote on earlier today? 
Any, over there, wasn't that you? You're not a faith. Th thank you, okay. <clears throat> we started here, well actually we started with Eliza, let's go back there and throw it out for Eliza too, pouring out for her, but Zork here was one of my first text-based games and I love that very much in my Apple II, super sick. If anybody here worked on Zork or referred to Zork, thank you, applause for that, you guys did great. But our job going forward is actually some cross between Zork and Aaron Sorkin. <clears throat> I talked about this points already, broadly speaking, but I do want to get here to this you know, sort of interactive screenwriting, try to find two words to crash together to describe the field that we're in. Screenwriting is the act of delivering dialogue and direction for actors who then perform on stage, or, or stage writing, if you will. <clears throat> the interactive part is responding back using a fancy computer to answer back to a person who's talked to us. And that's going to be hard, and that's good news, because we'll all be employed for a long time to come. This is going to be difficult to figure out. This is the claim for job security here. That's great. Um, and I want to throw down the West Wing. If we're producing dialogue that's as compelling as this was on who likes the West Wing, raise your hand. Who's super excited about the election next week? Raise your hand. OK, right. So what the White House was as expressed in the show by Aaron Sorkin was a spectacular demonstration of dialogue in an ongoing series back and forth. In fact, people watch it for the dialogue alone. We should be producing bots in market that cause people to talk to them because the dialogue is so damn good they want to keep talking to them again and again. So somewhere between Zork and Aaron Sorkin sits our lives. <clears throat> As a technology challenge, summarize few points now, tie this up and go to Q&A, we'll be done in a few minutes. Is the technology you're shipping here a black box? If it is, you need to make it controllable and predictable. No magic. I didn't say linear, I'll make that point again, just predictable. As humans, we're very, very good at predicting highly nonlinear functions into muscle memory, but predictability and repeatability is the issue there. And can we help bring the atomic elements of computer conversation, content and intent, closer and closer together in the context of what's happening to help creators produce better work? Ah, this is really hard. Further challenges. What does my character talk about? What can they not talk about? And how do they handle the boundary conditions? I want to emphasize this boundary condition issue. It is often at the place when you ask someone a thing they don't know the answer to. They do not know the answer to. Their response and how they handle that does more to define that character than anything else they do. This is the exclusion issue. Hey, Darth Vader, can you talk about the current tax law? No, I'm building a Death Star model right now. Like how he handled, or I'm going to kill you. How Vader responds to that does more to define who he is as a character than let's talk about the Death Star. Well, I know you know about that. You're Darth Vader. I get that already. It is commonly the case I see in many posts on, on bot networks and bot threads in the Facebook group that kind of went nutter yesterday. Um, that was weird. Uh, <laughs> that uh, folks talk about, oh, this bot sucks because it didn't answer back a thing I typed into it or asked it back and forth. That does kind of suck, but I don't care that it answer everything. Uh, nobody in this room can answer every question I could ask you. We don't expect that of other humans. What we do expect is a reasonable, Esther, I don't really know much about how to make a pizza on the seventh continent of Antarctica, so I can't really help you ask her. At least I redirected you over there. You're like, oh, it's supposed to boink error? Like, I wouldn't say that to you. So how you handle an error condition is critical to defining a character and perhaps the most important thing you may do. What's my character's backstory? What do they want? Who are they similar to? What is the right tone, mood, style, word choice, and phrasing for what I'm trying to construct? And as a great tension that exists, this balancing act will continue. The more personality you add and the more specific and memorable you make a character may also be the more you limit your audience. Those things are highly in tension. That's a super bummer, but is the truth of this, going back to the art example for a minute. The more polarizing and, and greater advocacy and more specificity you give to a character. So when I mentioned Vader or Nemo and Dory or Buzz or Harry and Sally, you all knew in your head who those characters were. Those are perhaps general audience, very well-designed characters. But if I start naming other ones that bring out, oh, here's an easy one, Hillary and Trump. If I name those two out for a second, I polarize the room instantaneously. And this intention is why this is an art, not a science. So how far you go or don't go with the character advocacy and specificity is overall very good for, mem for memory and, and recall, um, engagement and retention for your nerds in the audience. We all know Hillary and Trump are, but if you shipped a Hillary bot for your company and a Trump bot for your company, you split the country and your audience is cut exactly in half. So in that tension exists a thing we can't solve. That's not, you can't make art that everybody likes. Taste matters, that's okay. Um, but an issue we have to work with is this, which is true of, of the generative arts, broadly speaking. <clears throat>
As a summary point, computer technology has completely transformed all these industries over the past 25 years. Audio, video, filmmaking, the rest have all changed in the tool sets I threw up before as well too. It is now transforming language and conversation itself. That's a huge deal. Let's talk more about it. We got four minutes for Q&A. Thank you. I'm out. I got three or four minutes for questions, and then we'll break at 10.30, is that right? Um, or, we have another set of you tell me when. Zero minutes? Let me take right. Zero minutes, should I sit down or? No, if you have okay. questions, I'm here. Do you think that regular people are ever, hello? Do you think that regular people are ever gonna be able to build bots? I mean, is that your guys' vision? I've heard you guys refer to Photoshop for bots with pull string and stuff, like is that, do we think we're ever gonna get there? Uh, uh, let me go strongly yes, but regular people don't want to use Photoshop. They also use iPhoto and they use Instagram. Um, the image processing capabilities of Instagram, comma, and social network, comma, billion users is a very different agenda than Photoshop. They're all good. That is, the, the, the act of taking a picture from a phone, twisting it, color, color cue correcting it, and posting it in, I don't know, three or four seconds of time to pull off, less than 10 seconds, anyway, if you can get that today. That's a spectacular achievement. Um, and is used in lots of ways by a giant consumer audience. And Photoshop is used to create phenomenal digital art by a smaller audience who's paying more to produce billboards and produce visual effect. Yes, all that, everywhere in between. So there's a, I, I, I'm making this up, fast forward 10, 15 years, I think you'll see a large, or even one year, you'll see a large spectrum of the amount of effort versus artistic control sort of issue, and we should hit 20 points on that spectrum, broadly speaking. I think that's true digital imagery is everywhere today, which is what killed Kodak. But yeah, make sense? Yeah. Other questions? Over here. And just so you guys know, when you ask questions, make sure you get the mic for the recording. Um, so I guess my question would be about that analogy between you know iPhoto, Instagram, Photoshop. Um, and whether or not there's actually sort of a competition of either definitions or, or whatever in the space. Because the, the conversations that you're talking about designing feel fairly you know, arduous to create, fairly intensive. How do you see the spectrum of, I don't know if it's automated, you know, assistant services, bots that fit into the space um, falling out of this? In other words, we talk a lot about bots and we sort of smear the canvas like mm. we do with apps. So, are there cases where conversation is actually not very useful? Like, for example, we have ATMs, yeah. right? And if I had to have a goddamn conversation that's 15 minutes long just to get some money out, that would be really annoying. So how, how do you sort of think about approaching that question of what's appropriate in which, in which space? I, that's, have you thought about it for a second and a half? <laughs> that, that seems like a pretty important design question about what you're trying to achieve for what end. So just to use the example you said it back at you without naming the particular partner, in the finance technology industry in general, we've been in several meetings with folks, and is the design criteria to build a bot that is better than the average teller behind the desk, a bot that is better than the average ATM interaction, or a bot that's better than the branch manager, or a bot that's better than how we think the branch, man branch manager should be, are like four different targets. We debated that for N hours deep, and that was, those were super different agendas. Um, having said that, uh, maybe more direct answer, if I'm closing a transaction on an eBay, which I did to buy a 1970s ski suit last week um, for a uh, ski t uh, US ski team fundraiser, I had to get my proper 70s disco outfit. Um, that's like purchase, yes, confirm, please, yes. That's just a set of button presses on a structure message, please ship that. I don't want to end up d debate with you whether I'm closing a transaction or not. So very much not a conversational open experience there. Um, and many, many are though. So I think that's a spectrum of those. And uh, I guess I would comment one of the interesting things about this field is that, um, picking on any of the platforms here, Slack or, um, or Kick or, or Messenger, the intermingling of open conversation, of structured messages, of quick replies, of sort of HTML5-ish GUI next to open language is a very interesting design palette you can pick, one can pick from. And the intermingling of those elements is not true of me talking to you face to face. We're just only in these language talking to you. Also like Alexa, you can only talk to that. That, in effect, design restriction puts a different burden on creators in that space than it does in the visual and, and touch screen space. Um, and we quite c commonly use that full palette in products we build for clients as well too. So I think that's a, a case by case decision. I think we have time for one or two more. One, one more, one more. All right, I'm honored. 
Um, so, so you made a very emphatic point in your presentation that um, TV, movie, drama is not something that's algorithmically generated, but in fact it can be algorithmically generated. It's just done by humans. So there's books like Save the Cat, which are like the 27 plot points of all movies. Um, and so my question, which is related to what Chris asked, is um, today we can algorithmically generate these things that are modeled off of things that have existed before. And so there's a strong argument for those as sort of a mediocre personality or art experience. And in your presentation, you seem to argue that everything should be a fantastic art experience. So do you think there's room in the bot world for mediocre bots? Well, we're already making those, so yes. Great. <laughs> Um, is the first answer. Second answer is, um, just to tr tr throw out a half silly bot joke, I if I took every YouTube clip of every space alien with respiratory damage, averaged them together, and then pulled out a lung damaged alien, I would never get, but Luke, I'm your father. Would never come at the far side of that. The, um, the act of creation makes the, un the generates black swans. Um, so I think that it is totally possible to generate the average cat, the average alien, the average personality, or even sub-segmented via some sharded database search of YouTube, for sure. Um, but by its definition, that is a blurred average of what it came from. Y you, will, you will never have the originality of the act of character creation from that process. And furthermore, I entered this field five years ago not because I wanted to talk to the average cat on YouTube. I also got onto this field to talk to exact facsimile of myself or you. You're already Hillary, I can already talk to you. I'm interested in talking to the characters that have not yet been on Earth, we're about to go create, because they aren't human, they're not here yet, and we're gonna go make them. And those are conversations we couldn't have because they're not of us, they're something that is the act of creation. I think that's why you go see a Seurat painting. It doesn't look like a photograph. I mean, photography is his own art, I'm not dissing photography, but that's a, the world that's seen through the eye of an artist and transformed and pressed through that filter that is unique to that particular act of authorship. We can now do that in language for the first time. And so to be able to, yes, do bots for Vader and bots for Miss Piggy or bots for the Call of Duty characters, sure, that, those are ones I've, the other folks here have worked on in the built in the room. Those are characters that already exist today. They're being transformed into interactive conversation. I think we will soon see the characters that are native to this field. And in that case, um, then we'll find that Star Wars really was a film first. The Hobbit really was a book first. Um, and Othello and King Lear really were stage plays first. That's the native form those things come from. And that is, I think, most resonant with what we'll find in that field. We have yet to find the ones in computer conversation. I'm super stoked to meet those people and talk to them. Sorry, I'm, I think we're out of time, but I can talk to you the rest of the two days. Or one last question? OK, okay Amir, he let you in. He let you in. I'm particularly interested, given your background at Pixar, when you talk about um, character-based bots, so we, you know, one of the companies at Betaworks that we developed is the Poncho bot. And we we have, talk about Poncho a lot, yes. Yeah, so we have, if you look at the back end of Poncho, you see, what you see is you see people saying, thank you, please, like every second or third um, interaction with Poncho. So talk for a minute about the, if you could, about these sort of affordances, we as humans, we know that these things are bots. But we're, um, it, it seems like we're like remarkably ready as humans, even yeah. though like we want sure. to believe. Same story my daughter and the Alexa Echo in our house. This is the need we have to anthropomorphize everything. We are all egotistical monsters. We're humans. I see a chair. It's kind of like a human. It's got legs. It's got a back. When back. I'm giving it anatomical dimensions. It's a chair, for Christ's sake. We anthropomorphize everything. That's an innate human need we have to anthropomorphize our own children and babies or before they're born as well too, to give us the sympathy to raise them as a species. It's like an innate genetic desire that we have. The fact that language comes out of a bot or an echo speaker in English or pick your favorite flavor of Mandarin or Spanish, whatever it happens to be, is our native tongue. It's not like a computer screen with a mouse and a keyword I got a bang on. It's talking to me or texting at me, which is what the other billion humans just did to me last, the last five minutes. So of course I'm gonna anthropomorphize it. The fact that question gets asked is weird to me. We should assume that's always true I, I and wonder why it's, it's not. I, I'm really interested, and we could do this in a separate session, but I'm really interested in like when you create a character like Doi, like how, how, do, you f how do you think about and form that character? Um, and so when we think about Doi as a bot, how, would, you know, how do you think about the, the relationship and the, the, um, the, the, 
That's the outer, that, yeah, the that question is not, there's not a 30 second answer to that question, but I love it. character that you but want to talk to. Let's get a room and go for half an hour and I'll, in 30 minutes, do the best that I can with that discussion. Love that. Thank okay, you. super. Tag your it. <laughs>